So here is f of x, usual continuous function. And what is this capital F of x? And in the beginning of introduction, this was called area function, right? Because f of x continues, we know it's defined. There's a function that's defined. And fundamental theorem of calculus says that this function f of x is actually an antiderivative of f of x, right? So that's the connection. And then we recently we pushed that um, limit to infinity. And this one is called improper integral, right? So let's think about this operation, big picture. That's what they say. You start with a little continuous function, and we create a new function by putting integral. Pay attention where x is. x is there. That's area function, integral. And then we push to the limit. And we're going to do the same thing with going to do the same thing with that little a n. Let's see. Turns out. So about this all this. All right. So here's a little a n, and so you can see we start with a little a n. Instead of putting an integral and putting it, you know, integral something to x, we use the summation notation, right? You start with a n, make a little comparison, some sort of function, but integer function, and put this integral-like symbol going from one through n. N is the variable there. So f x there, and that's the upper limit, and n there, that's the upper limit. Given a sequence, we're going to add up all the way up to n nth term. That is called Sn, just like integral. I hope you see the um, similarity between that. If I push that to infinity, that's going to be kind of this version. In there. All right? So this Sn is called a partial sum of this a n. And we use this partial sum to define what we mean by 1 to infinity. Remember how we did this improper integral? We, we send it to a to you know, b and afterwards we send b to infinity, right? So whether you compute, be able to compute it or not, we think about up to n, the sum, a partial sum of up to n. Suppose you compute it or, you know, think about the existence of that formula and then sending to add n to infinity. That's the this notation here with order of operation clear, um, clearly stated is what we mean by 1 to infinity. If you're looking at a you know, new theorem or new result, we have to understand this 1 to infinity, infinite sum, in this way. First, think about the partial sum and as a new sequence, you come up with the limit of a sequence. Here's one thing you have to pay attention, is that this limit is different from limit of a n, right? Does that make sense? Where the a n is going is different from where this one's going. We're adding all up, right? So just like this one, we have a function, create a new function. I have one sequence, I created another sequence. a n, from there, new sequence is created. What is the name of this s n? Partial sum partial sum of the sequence an. Make sense? Yeah. So when we write it like this, sometimes it's defined and sometimes not. So that's a little abuse of notation. They will just write it like this, even if, even though this doesn't exist. Right? So I hope that doesn't bother you too much. All right. I thought it's important to get used to this logical structure. Um, for some reason, you are used to f of x to capital F of x. This one, I realize it takes, takes some time. So why don't we do this? It's very simple practice. A n is a sequence starting with the uh, index 1. State the definition of nth partial sum, which is denoted by S n itself, and state the definition of this notation. All right, so far you, you guys have been doing really great with the um, properly using the integral variable. So you have to do the same thing. When you switch from, you know, um, Sn to uh, An to Sn, you have to use this dummy variable for k not An, right? Just like integral variable t. And your actual main variable goes upstairs. 
So it's not n equals k equals 1 and a n. It is k equals 1, a k, right? So if you write that up, when k equals 1, that's a1. Versus k equals 2, it's a2. When k equals 3, a3, all the way up to a n. That's what this Sn is standing for, right? And if you keep doing that, limit n approach infinity, what's going to happen to this number as you keep adding? No. So that's the what the sum is about. This sum is slightly different from the Riemann sum. You see, that one here only involves k only, right? There's no n involved in there. Often it can be separated, so Riemann sum can be um, separated outside with n outside, but again, that's slightly different. Right, is that okay? That's a par nth partial sum and infinite sum. Okay, it's infinite series. So this one eventually kick in as we play a lot with these two quantities, and they're not equal, right? And right now it's not equal, but maybe a week later it's going to be equal to you. But remember, <laughs> it's not equal, right? A to infinity, the area underneath it, right? And this one, oh, it's going to infinity, it must be equal. Only when it is a Riemann sum, right? But it is not Riemann sum. There's no n in it, right? There's no k over n, nothing like that. This one is kind of close, but it is not in the sense that Riemann sum getting closer to integral. It is not arbitrarily close, this one. It's just a similar number. Okay, sim, you know, close is not a good, good expression. Okay, so just remember why is it different? Because it's not Riemann sum. So, here I call this one there again a n, nth partial sum, infinite sum. That's what these arrows are from. You start with one sequence, create another sequence, push it all the way infinity, and create a number, right? Let me do that again. One sequence, create another sequence, just like integral, and you push to infinity, create a number, improper integral. Now, this is unofficial name. Nobody calls this one anything. Um, it is just some note usually up here, but I find it's very important, and you will see why. And it's just like a fundamental theorem of uh, calculus, so I decided to call this fundamental theorem of series here, just in my course. All right, this is integral, right? If you differentiate integral, you go back to the original function. Remember that relationship, right? Anti-differentiation, differentiation, you go back. Those are the two things. So differentiation, this is not differentiable function, it's a sequence. But taking the difference is kind of analogous thing with derivative. And I'm claiming that if the Sn is a partial sum, if you subtract the adjacent partial sum, you go back to the original sequence. So let me explain that. Also, that pay attention to the red color part. That that only va it is only valid for n greater than equal to. So, S n. What is S n? A n, a one, a two, all the way up to a n. Right. That's what that is. I'm going to write down a few more terms at the end so that you can compare that with the Sn minus 1 better. So if that was An, what was the, you know immediately before following? A subscript and minus 1, right? That's different from An minus 1. The minus 1 is in the subscript, right? So that's that. What about Sn minus 1? This goes all the way up to the last subscript is at N minus 1, and it stops there, right? And we're subtracting these two. So what do you see? These two things are completely common, right? And they're cancel. What are you left with? An. Okay? So if somebody um, gave you Sn, hiding An, not showing the, that one, then you can easily calculate An, right? By simply doing that business. They gave you Sn, not giving you a k, you can calculate a k easily. It's also the same. They give you the integral and didn't tell you what the integrand function is, 
then you can easily find that integral function. What do you do? For example, they didn't give you this, but they gave you, you know, cosine 2x. That's my integral. And what's in there? Derivative of that one, right? So it's a lot easier going, they give you cosine 2x. What is the integral? We have to learn a whole lot to do that so far, right? So it's a lot easier process. So this is a lot easier process. If you have partial sum and partial sum, figuring out an is a lot easy. The other way is a lot harder, right? I give you an and you compute sn. That's a lot harder than integral problem, all right? So I decided to approach this whole um, nth partial sum business completely opposite way. This is um, very different from usual introduction, but I think it's the, the best way. But while we're doing this, we'll be doing this um, little bit of a linear operator. It behaves a lot like integral symbol. Think about this as a sum, right? Adding, the, especially the finite sum, a1, a b1, a2, b2, you can reorganize all the a1s here, a2s there, all the b1s and b2, right? No problem. You can always do that. And if it's all multiplied by same number, you can factor out that number out outside and put the parentheses and add all these a1s, ak's, and multiply later. You can easily see that this is simple distribution law or reorganizing many different terms. So no problem to understand this one in the finite. Here's a key part. See if I have infinite sum. Here is an infinite sum. If I pass with an infinite sum, is this still true? Usually they make a big deal out of it, but let's, let's think about it. These are individual sequences, right? N is a main variable. So what was the hypothesis and limit laws? We talked about it last time. There was some hypothesis and then there's a limit laws when you add and when you subtract, when you multiply. What was that? Limit exists. Individual thing limit exists. And then you can distribute the limit law, limit symbol. So I'm going to take that linear operator, finite sum, and treat it as if it is a one sequence. Do you see there's a one sequence? What is the main variable here? One sequence variable. N is the variable, right? So I'm going to call that one AN. The whole thing is a n. It's a partial sum up to n. So it's a partial sum up to b, right? And this is partial sum up to c. It's a new sequence. That's what we're comparing. So limit n approaches infinity. C n would be sending this one to infinity, right? Is equal to the limit approaches infinity of a n plus b n, right? This is always equal because the same sequence, a n plus b n. And if you want to pass to next level, which one has infinity, infinity in there, that means you have to send that limit operator distributed here like this and distributed here like that. Correct? Then they are called individually is k1 to infinity. This one is called k1 to infinity. To go from here to infinity level, you want to want to go from here to there, right? What is this one called? Going from going here to there. That's the limit law, right? That's the limit law. That limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. It distributes over like that. But what was the condition? Yeah, this individual limit must exist. Then you can go to that. So when you enter like this, you can't just go from partial sum to here. You know this one exists, that one exists, if you know that, and it is the same as the sum of the two things. Unfortunately, that's an important thing that you have to always check. So what's the condition here? Individual limit here exists. That is what this condition is about. I think I wrote down an example. Now here's an answer. Individual this one and that one exist, then this happens. Right? So, you know, that's the argument, but simply when you distribute an infinite sum, there is one more condition than finite sum. There's no condition in finite sum, right? 
you rearrange it. But if it's an infinite sum, the sum distributed, what is the condition? You must have the property that individual sum must exist. All right, here's an example. If k and k minus k, k plus minus k, that's a zero, right? So this individual sum exists, correct? Sum of a flat zero is always zero. How about this one in here? Adding all the k's up to n, do you think that exists? If you keep adding one, two, three, well, it goes to infinity, right? So this doesn't exist. That doesn't exist individually. So if you pass to infinity, that one is a still zero. You're always adding zero, infinity, you know, keep adding is always zero. So that's a zero, but that's infinity, and that's infinity, right? So from there, it's in determinate form. So you can't say these two are equal to each other. It's order of operation. You all the way up to it at infinity, and that's behavior plus the behavior. Don't think this one has a hey partial sum. Don't they just cancel each other anyway? That's a partial sum. If you push to infinity first, that's the order of operation that's listed in here. All right. One thing you have to remember is that if you have something like this, you can't just pass to infinity. Make sure everything is actually finite um, defined sequence. Limit actually exists. All right. So here I'm stating that you know, I already said the answer. Which one do you think is easy? I, f I give you AN, you figure out SN. I give you SN, you figure out AN. Which one was easy? On the right, right? I give you nth partial sum, figuring out what is this, you're subtracting it here. That's how simple this one is. The other one is usually very hard. So we're hoping that I have a random, you know, AN. I want to figure out SN. What do you mean by figuring out? Sn is something that we understand. N, n squared, n to the third, n factorial, log n, sine n, those things, right? That's what we mean by solving. If, if it is outside the realm of that kind of function, you have no chance that you can write this answer down in here. So going backward, just like the derivative, right? We differentiate the function we know to create the basic integral table, just like that. So I'm going to start like this. I'm hoping that what what creates this SN being N? What, you know, sequence you start with this so that your answer is simply N? What sequence should I start it here <coughs> such, such that your sequence is simply N squared? Things like that. If you understand that, and then you can do substitution, all the integral technique <coughs> to build up a nice um, way of recognizing, oh, those sequences, I know how to do it because I know these answers. I hope this line of argument is similar to the derivative um, and to derivative because you start with the you know simple thing that you already know and try to recognize it and it's all over again right partial fraction decomposition kicking it again because of uh, integration technique okay let's start with sn equals n sn is n so that means k going from one to n. This has to be specified. What is the initial index? It could be zero. Something. It has to be specified in that problem. So putting the at k equals one, I think, assuming that it is the case that it starts from one. Um, we don't know what that is, but what we know is that altogether is always n. Some of you probably already know the answer because it's the simplest one. What should be a k? Any guess? It's actually constant, right? AK is constant. AK is one always? Yeah, one, adding one, 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 n times is n, right? That's one way, but who knows? Someone else come up with a, another clever AK, put it in there, hey, that's still n, right? So can that happen? So rest, next argument takes care of that, no. A case uh, must be one. That is the only way that happens. It's unique, exactly, yes. So that's that theorem, fundamental theorem of series. <laughs> what is that? FTS. Again, this is non-standard term. Don't use this any, anywhere else. Sn minus S. What is An? Theorem says Sn minus Sn minus 1, right? Sn minus 1. But 
this only holds, remember that red part? This, this formula only holds what kind of n? Greater than 2. If it is 1, you plug in an s1 minus 1 as 0. But in our definition, s0 is not defined. s1 is the smallest index you can read. So therefore, you cannot plug in n equals 2 to this equation. But other than that, we saw that all the way up to n, n minus 1 gives you exactly a n. Always, right? So let's do that. What is it? A n is n. What is S n minus 1? S n is n. So S n minus 1 is n minus 1, correct? Yeah, it's n minus 1. So n and n cancel. It gives you 1. So we figured out a n had no choice. Always 1 for all those indices greater than or equal to 2. But we haven't any concluded anything about A1. So that's true. But what is A1 supposed to be? Always S1. There's only one term at the beginning. The partial sum must be that A1, right? So what is the formula? Formula says S1 is 1. So A1 must be 1, right? So in this argument, we could only conclude up to you know, N equals 2. But we check to verify that A1 is still 1, right? With this two argument, we can conclude An is actually always N, no matter what your N is, even when N equals 1. If it happened to a number that do doesn't fall into this formula, then you have to piecewisely define it. Okay? Make sense? All right. I'm going to do um, Sn equals N squared. Um, with you all. Let's, let's practice that one. And that's starting from 1 to n, a k. And our question is that, what is a n? Does that make sense? All right. So, here, for a really easy formula we discovered out of it. If you add 1, n times n. That's what we discovered from here, right? That's pretty easy. We didn't need all this complicated thing to understand this. But next one really makes a difference. So let's do um, a n being s n minus s n minus 1 for, again, for what kind of n? Only greater than or equal to 2. You have to set aside a n at the very end. So what is uh, what is S n? N squared, right? And what is S n minus 1? N minus 1 squared, correct? Yeah? So what is it? N squared minus N squared minus 2n plus 1, my binomial theorem. What do you see? 2n minus 1. So what is A n? 2n minus 1, for what kind of n? Greater than or equal to 2, only when n is greater than or equal to 2. So let's see what, what a1 is. What is a1? s1, right? By definition. But we have a complete formula for s1. What is s1? 1 squared. So it's 1. Right? This formula, when n equals 2, gives you what? 3, is that right? 2 minus 1, 3. And anything higher, it tells you. But this formula is not applicable at this stage, a, uh, n equals 1. But if you actually plug in n equals 1, what do you get? 2 times minus 1. So it happened to coincide. It happened to coincide. It, there are actually examples that they don't coincide. right? So you don't automatically assume that formula you have here automatically extends to a1. But we checked it. It actually holds, right? So by looking at these two cases, we realize that a n is actually just 2n minus 1 with n greater than or equal to 1. It actually holds. Make sense? So we found a formula. So I'm stating, so what do we discover here? Is the following. This part is the interesting part. We're doing this kind of derivative, discrete derivative business to discover facts about the sum. So k going from 1 to n, what are we adding? A k, right? But what is the formula of a k now? 2k minus 1. That's the formula right there. A k, a n is always 2n minus 1. So a k is 2k minus 1. This is supposed to be what? 
Sn. What is Sn? N squared. So what are the what are the two k minus one? K equals one. One. K equals two. Three. K equals three. Five. Right. These are odd numbers, right? How many odd numbers have we had? Not five. How many odd numbers here? It's k equals three, right? Three. So there are exactly n odd numbers. You add up, what magic happens? It becomes a perfect square. That's why we have discovered, right? If you add odd number n times, what, what happens to that number? becomes a perfect square. Did you know that? Yeah, if you add odd number, it becomes a perfect square. That's what we have discovered. But that's kind of weird. Who, who cares about odd number? I just want to probably want a formula for k. I want to add all the way up to k. So here's a linearity. Remember, this is a e, um, finite sum. You can do all the linearity. You can split that. k going from 1 through n, and minus there, k equal 1 through n, n. That's supposed to be n squared. Believe that? You can split the summation over addition and subtraction. That's linearity. What can we do with this 2 there? You can pull it out, right? Set aside. So you can pull out and nicely isolate this curious formula. That seems like interesting one. Very standardized. It's simple enough, right? Adding 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to n. What could that be? And here, does anyone know the answer? If you add n, fixed number, n times. That's what I, I, did, I was wrong. This is supposed to be negative 1. We did that. If you add 1 n times, what do you get? n, right? 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus n times is n. We just discovered that in a difficult way. And here's n squared. Make sense? All right, let's isolate. This is what we want to know. This is, seems like an interesting formula. So here is, if you add 1 through n, k, and this, you can see, is n squared plus n. And if you divide everything, by 2. So this is better known as n times n plus 1 divided by 2. All right? This is also called n choose 2. If there are n colored things, how many ways to choose the two different colors? And that's n choose 2, binomial coefficient happen again. All right. So, wow, there is this k formula now, right? And you can do k um, n cubed, and it'll give you k squared formula and things like that, right? So, next case is going to be Sn being n cubed, and what's going to happen, right? That's, um, I'd like to leave that as an exercise. Not here an exercise, but uh, homework exercise, all right? But we're going to enter, actually, what's more important in here. And this Pn, Qn, these are the fr um, uh, uh, rational functions. But this Rn, what was, why Rn it was important? Connection with the Taylor series, x to the n, right? So let's see what kind of An gives you the sum um, Rn. So that's very important result. So pay attention to this one. You probably need to memorize this one. Have you seen this formula in the, when you're learning a Riemann sum in Calc 1? They actually do introduce this formula in Riemann sum. And there are various different proofs, um, but I, I like this way of in introducing this. I think it's more natural. All right. So these are the polynomial cases. You got the idea. You just subtract them off and do the algebra and isolate it. Let's do the same thing. The same idea, but a slightly different function. So Rn, right? So what is it? K going from 1 through n. Um, this time is more conventional to start from 0. Okay? Because I think r to the 0 is 1, and it counts. But when it is n, when n equals 0, n equals 0 doesn't count, right? Think about you know, k starting from 0 to n over k, sticking in k equals 0 doesn't really count. So they don't really care about k equals 0, start from 1. But here, if you 
you get a k equals uh, k equals zero, and you can start from zero to zero. That r to the zero actually makes sense. So they usually go to r equals zero. So we don't know what that is, but what do we know? S n minus S n minus one is supposed to be um, a n. So I'm going to set aside a n is that. So what is um, so for what kind of value is this uh, valid here for n greater than or equal to not 2 anymore. We can go all the way down to S0, right? N being 0 is okay. So this one being 0 is okay. So N greater than or equal to 1, right? All right? So that this formula we're about to discover is valid for N greater than or equal to 1. So AN is, what is that? RN? SN is RN. How about SN minus 1? R to the N minus 1, right? Or is there a nice way to simplify this one? Anybody? There are some common factors. R to the right, n minus 1 in here. That's the lowest, lowest factor. Think about 2 and 1, 3 and 2. That's a common factor. If you factor it out, that whole thing going out is 1. What remains here? n minus 1 copy factored out, and how many copy remains in the first term? R to the n was there. If you factor it out exponentially, you subtract the how much it's factored out. So what is the exponent here? 1. Make sense? Okay. So a n, now we discover that um, r minus 1, we set aside that one, r to the, because it does not involve n, r to the n minus 1. So that's the formula. Fair enough? All right, let's go back and plug it in there and see what kind of formula you get. Um, so that's only true for n greater than or equal to um, 1. When n equal a, n equals 0, what do you get in here, n equals 0? You get 1, right? But if you plug in n equals 0, you don't get 1. You know? This 1 over r, when n equal, this from this formula, when n equals 0 is 1 over r, so this is r minus 1 divided by r. This is what we get. Correct? So um, these two things are no longer equal to each other. So it's a different formula. Okay? So here's how you write it. Sn is k sine from 0 to n a k. That's all formula. We have a nice formula starting from k equals 1. Correct? Not starting from k equals 0. So can I set aside a0 like this and starting from k equals 1 to n a k? The reason I did that is that I have a nice formula for a a k starting from 1 and I don't for a a0. So I set aside and I can replace this one with a formula. Does that make sense? All right. So we have the following. Sn is given by rn here. So left-hand side is rn supposed to be equal to a0. What's a0? We figured out it's 1. Plus, starting from k equals 1 and n, um, these all a k starting from greater than 1, we have a formula r minus 1, r to the a k is a k minus 1. Is that right? So, this is a constant r minus 1, there's no k in it, we can factor it out, so it enters like this, r to the n minus 1, because we want to nicely isolate whatever the k involved in here, right? So, how about that r minus 1 factored out? r to the k minus 1, is that right? Can somebody make this k minus 1 a lot cleaner then? Whereas if, if it's a simpler, that's always better. How about, can you just set aside the negative 1 is 1 over r part? Yeah, you can do that. But also, if you start from, this is called re-index, it starts from these, these indexes, um, exponents is changing when k equals 1, that's a 0, right? Correct? When k equals 2 is a 2, so this, this part is really r to the 0, r to the 1, go all the way up to, what is the ending term? n minus 1. 
either you can set that aside, but this is usually their choice. If it is like this, why don't we call the index from 0 to n minus 1 and rk? Is that okay? So that part goes like this, r to the n minus 1, r minus 1. Why don't we re-index it? So k starting from something to something, so that is called, just called r to the k. What is the first co um, f exponent? 0. What is the last exponent? n minus 1. Although it looked different, after you write it out, those n terms, that's exactly the same thing, right? This is called re-indexing. You can re-index it, make it a little bit cleaner, and it just looks like now starting from 0 to n minus 1. So here's a trick question. How many terms are there? n terms, that's right. You count the 0 and 1 and 2 all the way to n minus 1, so there are n terms in there involved. Correct. That looks like a nice formula. Let me pull that out. All you have to do is just divide everything by um, r minus 1. So here is our master formula. Okay, going from 0 to n minus 1. If you add all the n terms, starting from 1, right, to all the way up to whatever the last one is, is r to the n minus 1, divided by r minus 1, right? That's the formula we discover out of all that. If you start from r to the n, and apply fundamental theorem of series, which I named it, and you arrive at here. Nice formula. If you add up all the powers, then there is a neat formula. Right? That's pretty neat. But they usually write it backward. 1 minus r to the n and 1 minus r. We say the same, same thing. If you multiply numerator and denominator negative 1, you get this one and you know it's the same thing. The reason they write it like this is because usually r is in between 1 and negative 1. And what happened to r to the n? If n approaches infinity, and if r is in, in between 1 and negative 1, it approaches 0. Geometric sequence theorem, right? So this converges to 1 divided by 1 minus r. Just like the answer of the quiz problem. B divided by 1 minus r, right? That's an alternative proof of already what we did. But this is more detailed proof of uh, through the partial sum. All right? So this is the important fact. Here, I wrote it down. Let me summarize one more time. k going from 0 to n minus 1, r to the k, is 1 minus r to the n and 1 minus r. That's a um, fundamental fact about the geometric series. Okay, Geometric finite series. That's the name of this one. Formula for the geometric finite series. Finite. If you pass through infinity, that tends to disappear if you have a right choice of R, and that becomes a formula for the geometric infinite series. Um, formula of the geometric infinite series. Okay? So let's expand this one one more time. Remember, very first term is R to the 0 is 1, right? Now, they tweak this formula a lot, so therefore, you have to understand the relationship more than just, uh, you know, the way it's written. They can easily trick you. First term is 1, right? What is the next term? Multiply by r. What is the next term? Multiply by another r. What is the next term? Multiply by another r. Keep multiplying r to get to the next term. That's the important property in here. You end up at some sort of index there, right? But what is important is that how many things are written down? n terms. That number of terms appeared right there as a formula. It's one thing to remember. What is this r in the right-hand side? That is a ratio to go to, to you multiply to go to the next term. Okay? So here's another more, slightly more general version. If I start with a, and then multiply by r, and then multiply by another r, then multiply by another r, and go all the way up to a to the r, n minus 1. How many terms are listed? n terms. This is still r to the 0, r to the 1st, r to the 2nd. That is the indexing that you pay attention and you'll agree that there are n terms, n minus 1 terms. One more is n terms are there, right? So do you see that? You can factor this one out, like this a, and 1 plus r, and enter our formula the same formula we had it before, correct? 
that's 1 through r to the n minus 1. So what was the formula for that? 1 minus r to the number of terms, 1 minus r, that common ratio between adjacent terms. So that's another important formula. So they wrote and write it like this. If you start like this, r to the k, k starting from 0 to n minus 1, still n terms, the formula is simply a times 1 minus r to the n, 1 minus r. So what is this a? Very first term. I guarantee you, recognizing the meaning of these ingredients involved in the formula is much faster and secure than try to manipulate the form into this thing. So what is this n here? Number of terms. Number of terms add up in there, right? And what is R? Common ratio. Common ratio. If the ratio is not common, you cannot apply this formula, right? Any adjacent term, you take the quotient, if it is constant R, not depending on N, then is this geometric series. And it follows this formula. All right? So, for example, if they write... 7, 7 times 5, 7 times 5 squared, all the way up to 7 times 5 to the 11, right? Suppose they wrote numbers like that. What is the formula? Do you agree if you take the quotient of any adjacent term, you always get 5, right? Yeah, so what is R? To get to the next term, always you multiply 5, right? So what is A? A is on another thing involved in there. What is A here? No? The very first term. The very first term. What is the very first term? Just the 7, right? <laughs> right. What is N? Number of terms, right? So how many number of terms are there? 12, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 11, and one more of the 12. So this one is equal to what quantity? 7 times 1 minus 5 raised to what power? 12, the number of terms, minus the common ratio of 5 there. That if you actually add all this number using the Mathematica, that number is supposed to be the same as this number. 7 times 1 minus 5 to the 12th divided by 1 minus 5. So that is called what? geometric finite formula for the geometric finite series. Right? Here is the most general form. There's always an initial initial term and always get to the you know next term by multiplying R. So that you can always recognize what how it doesn't matter how complicated this one is, plug in the first index, sometimes they put this one and five there, something like that. Put the um Put the first index and get A, and look at the index to get to see how many terms are there, and just simply quotient out to adjacent term and to, to get what R is. And you, once you know A, R, and N, you're good to go. You have everything about that formula. Make sense? Yeah. I think I'm over time. So I'm going to make those N cubed and sine N, those things, advanced problem. And you do that and figure it out, right? Right here, I wrote it down. And uh, this formula and more general formula, I think. But we'll enter infinite series tomorrow. Just focus on the finite series today.